begins. The great breakthrough in your life comes when you realize it that you can learn anything you need to learn to accomplish any goal that you set for yourself. This means there are no limits on what you can be, have or do. Good evening all of you for, to all our panelists and participants from India and good morning to all the panelists and participants from US. This is Professor Priya Jain from RV Institute of Management, your host for today's webinar. I hope all of you will definitely agree on the quotes by Albert Einstein, which I just read, that learning has no limit. So with the same motive and enthusiasm, we all are here for this webinar on business analytics, way forward education and industry. So on behalf of RV Institute of Management Bangalore, I would like to welcome all the panelists and attendees for today's session. So for be before beginning the today's session, let the se let the let's start the session with the invocation. You may Almighty bless all of us. Mm -hmm. So, before beginning of the session, let me give you certain guidelines. So, if you guys have any questions related to the session, you can post your questions in the QA column, which is being moderated by Dr. Santosh M and Professor Nagasuba Reddy from RV Institute of Management. Simultaneously, if you have any queries and anything which you need to ask, you can post your queries in the chat box, which is being moderated by Professor Gurudat Shanoi and Professor Dilip from our Institute of Management. So without any further ado, let us begin our first session for the day. Our first session for the day is on evolution of business analytics. And the resource person for our first session is Dr. Pushottam Bank, Director and Professor, RV Institute of Management, Bangalore. So now let me give a brief introduction of Dr. Bank. Dr. Bank is an enterprising academic leader and professor with a rich experience of 26 plus years in industry and academia at both national and international level. Dr. Bunk has completed his PGDM from Melbourne Business School, Australia, and his MBA from Monash University. Dr. Bunk has rich entrepreneurial experience of around 10 plus years in the food processing industry. He is also an expert panel of many institutions, universities, NGOs, and journals. Dr. Bunk has been conferred with many awards like Enterprising Academic Leader of the Year, Distinguished Educator, Best Director of B School in Karnataka, and many more. He is elected as Fellow of World of Productivity Science at Beijing, China recently. He is also a Research Fellow of Institute of Productivity, UK. Dr. Bung is offering management consultancy services to local businesses, institutions, and entrepreneurs as well. Very recently, he has completed a Harvard X course in collaboration with Pearson Global and Eureka Education Group UK on future of learning, which was anchored by Professor Richard Elmore, professor and authority in education and learning from Harvard. 
So now, without any further delay, I'll hand over the session to Dr. Bung to enlighten us about the evolution of business analytics. Over to you, Dr. Bung. Uh, thanks, uh, Priya. The, I would call uh, the webinar jockey of today and tomorrow for the generous introduction, right? So uh, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, good morning to the people from US. Right, uh, Ramesh is here. Good morning, pleasant. Good morning, Ramesh. I, <clears throat> it's nice to host the webinar on the you know emerging area, uh, which is business analytics, right? So, uh, without uh, any further delay, I would like to cover some of the basic aspects. But before I start, right, I would like to you know. Um, say something that this business analytics is not just evolved in last 30 30 or 40 years people used to do analytics even before that time immemorial right but the way they used to do is different than it is happening now right that's the only difference and i strongly propound that because i would like to share my own personal example right I hail from a Maheshwari community. It's a very small community from Rajasthan, purely into business. All people are purely into business, except people like me, you know, who are kind of outliers, right? Okay. I, when I was a kid, right, when I was, uh, you know, maybe seven, eight years old. So this is, I'm telling the story of 45 years back. Okay. Now that I'm 50, so 45 years back. Uh, our grandfather, my grandfather, Champalal Bang, was kind of a very, very dominant business player from the North Karnataka region. We used to run a, a oil mill, right? A typical oil mill in a <clears throat> taluka place called Shorapur, Surpur, Gulbarga district. We used to accompany, I used to accompany my grandfather when he, whenever he used to go to market for buying that is we call a tendering process which was there at that time and later it became an auctioning process so we used to go with him to all uh, the so-called commission agents there were around 40 plus in in the small place like shorapur and he used to you know check each and every lot i'll just quote one example of groundnut we all know groundnut right so he used to buy the groundnut in lots and we used to go to all these uh, commission agents one by one and he used to check each and every lot and quote the price for it, right? And parallelly, he used to check the entire thing, what's the weight, what could be the moisture content, what could be the dust content, other wastages, right? All that he used to, you know, just, uh, you know, feel it by taking handful of groundnuts. And then based on the number of bags in that lot, if it is a lot of 40 bags, right? He used to take exactly 40 seats. He used to just uncover the, you know, the kernel part of the groundnut and take only the seats, exactly 40 seats and keep it in his pocket, okay? Similarly, next lot, if it is of 20 bags, exactly 20 seats, he used to keep it in his pocket. So like that, we used to cover all the commission agents, come back to the office, Okay, shop, and there he used to take out all that, right? And uh, exactly, he used to sun dry it for one full day, morning nine till five next day, okay? And check how much is the moisture loss, okay? And then that lot, all right? And it used to weigh around one kg or two kg, whatever it is. He got one baby, very experimental expeller from UK at that point of time, I'm saying, right? And he used to run that into that expeller. Expeller is a machine which converts seed into oil and oil cake. Oil cake is a byproduct and you'll get oil out of it. So double filtered oil we used to manufacture and we used to sell it, okay? That small experimental expeller at that point of time, it costed very huge amount, but used to run that and see how much is the oil I'm getting out of it. Okay. which is very, very important for setting up a price. And exactly at the evening 6.30, he used to you know, listen to the All India Radio because prices used to announce 
from the Bombay market, right? And used to quote his price. So that is how he used to, you know, figure out the unit economics, right? Entire business is all about having a strong control on the unit economics. If you deviate there, if you don't keep a track of it, then you will end up in incurring huge losses and, and one fine day you go bankrupt also, right? So that is how he used to control on the unit economics, what price he is going to set and not just that, right? Every day, right, until and unless the balance sheet gets tallied, right, which in, in Marwadi we call, you know, tallying pota baki, cash in hand, right? Even if there is a difference of one rupee, nobody is allowed to go home for sleep. They have to tally the balance sheet and then show him the exact cash that is available in hand and the, as per the bal balance sheet and they are allowed to go home. So that's how he used to analyze the things, right? Financially, production aspects, quality aspects, what is the yield from the groundnut that he is getting, right? And he used to have a strong control on that. That's how his business grew like crazy, right? And he became a master. Even the chartered accountants, you know, used to, you know, get shaken whenever there is a debate happening between say Champalal Bang and the chartered accountant. So that's how powerful they were when it comes to analytics, right? So this is story I'm telling you 50 years back, right? He's not there now. Champalal Bang is not there, right? But, you know, that tradition continues. Even today, you know, if you walk into any Maheshwari community businesses, you will see the same practice even today. Right. I got to know when I visited the Birla Nua Limited, same thing is kept track by Kumar Mangalam Birla even today. Right. There the said Champalal used to do it on the back of envelope, on a piece of paper in his mind. Right. Without calculators. You ask him any, any calculation, in no time he used to give the answer. Right. That's how powerful they were in analytics. That's the reason Maheshwari community is one of the strong communities, business communities, not only in India, but across the world, right? Even Birla hails from this community. That's the reason I quoted that example, right? But the way they are monitoring the business today is technology driven, right? I saw, you know, the dashboard of the Kumar Mangalam Birla for every division. He has a dashboard. First thing in the morning that he looks at is the dashboard, right? which has uh, three colors, red, yellow, and the green, right? Green, he will not bother about. Green means things are going fine. Yellow, he will be worried about it, but he will come back to it later. But immediate attention will be on the, the what do you call as KPIs, key performance indicators, which through which he controls the business, right? Otherwise, it is very, very difficult to control the business. So many divisions. He is having his operations in 70 plus countries, right? How can he control, right? Through this simple metrics he used to control, his immediate attention used to go on the, the, the parameters which are red in color, which requires immediate intervention, immediate action. So he used to work on that, right? So then the Champalal also used to do the same thing. And today, the Kumar Mangalam Birla is also doing the same thing. But the way they are doing is different, right? So that is my submission, right? And especially we, the Indians, are very good at analytics, right? There is no, no second thought there. Who started? You can go and, uh, you know, search back in the history, right? I, I you know, I, with strong conviction, I would say the international trade was not started by the UK people or the British people or European people. It was started by Gujus of India, right? So that, those are the people who started international trade long, long back. Right? That's the history. So it's not a new phenomena. So don't get confused to that. But only thing is it has got now the good attention because it has been made very easy, right? So by single, by sitting at one place, a person like Kumar Mangalam Birla can control all his businesses. So that is the power of business analytics, right? So with that story, 
right i would like to start my presentation right just a second i just yeah there you go all right yeah are you all uh, seeing my slide uh, priya yes sir okay yeah. yes sir good 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 I will be talking about the evolution of analytics and the way forward. So that is the topic. Right? I would like to begin with a, the first quote by our favorite Deming. We all know Deming, right? Man behind quality movement. What he says is, "In God, right? We all trust, but all others must bring data, right? So data is the new oil. Without data, we can't do anything today, right? Any decision to be made." any insight to be drawn that is possible only if you have a data right that is the power of data today right so objectives is i will be talking more on the introduction front the ramesh will be covering you know introduction to the world of analytics is a, what i am going to cover a professor ramesh rajgopalan authority in analytics from us has taught in various elite new universities of us he will be covering on the educational aspects right what are the developments that are happening in the education space across the world so it will be covered by professor ramesh rajgopalan and uh, mr dag who is working for walmart and heading the the analytics wing of supply chain of walmart we know you know why the walmart is leading the world okay it's because of its strong hold on the supply chain management and you may be amazed the largest spender in it in us after white house right is walmart so right so he will be talking about how the analytics is used by the industry right so that he will be covering about and then of course we will be talking about the way forward now that we know you know what are things that are happening in education and how it is used by the industry so we will talk about where it is uh, heading right that's about the way forward okay so before i head i will want to launch a small poll to know right our understanding about the subject so i request all the participants right to please participate in the poll so that we all get to know together where do we stand so you can take a minute or so so please i have launched the poll priya is that poll launched yes sir okay i request the participants to take a minute or so and just tick the appropriate your response to the poll questions participants please participate in the poll very simple questions so you know and i think it is a single choice so you don't have to think much so whichever bucket you fall into right just tick that right that will give us a fair understanding about the profile of the attendees today and so that we can pitch it accordingly that's the whole purpose all right so i will wait till 2 minutes and then i will end the poll so please speed up 10 more seconds to go and uh, please uh, 
this is what we want we want you people to participate in this learning process right that's very very important for us right because you know i believe that it is not only we people that you know you people will learn from us we also learn so many good things from you right so together let us learn from one another that's the whole objective right so the moment it reaches 200 i will stop because you know we have good speakers lined up we don't want to eat their time so yeah so i will end polling here and let's look at the results right level of engagement right 736% are new to the area of business analytics and ramesh sir this is also important for you so that you can pitch accordingly and dug also can pitch accordingly right 44% have some a little understanding of uh, this space 16% have a good understanding and 3% okay have applied ba in some of the projects okay and what will be the scope for professionals in india 26% are saying moderate scope 71% right so i will go with the you know mass intelligence right so there is a huge scope and it is true also right and about the tools right at any point of time what kind of tool you have used 94% are saying excel 49% spss 16% r and 10% python 11% tableau 4% hadoop is just 2% and other tools is around 10% right so this gives us a very clear understanding of where we stand right the emerging tools right like r and python and tableau which have gained prominence in business analytics you know we need to learn those and of course definitely there is a huge scope no second thought i do also have voted for it right and uh, when it comes to understanding right uh, a long way to go right so that is the whole purpose behind organizing this webinar on business analytics so i will stop sharing the results okay and then close it so there you go right <clears throat> so the evolution i want to touch upon the evolution right so here if you look at right how were the things right if you go back by you know before 1980s right everything was kind of a a physical touch right all these marketing activities or sales activities everything was done kind of a manually human interaction right but later on right Uh, you know it is to internally generated data uh, no concept of social media then mobile was kind of not there right and data was you know very very in a very small uh, unorganized right and a little structured right it used to come in batches right because technology was not there online data streaming was not there uh, so many technology constraints i remember you know when i was kid we used to wait for days together to make a trunk call from one place to another place and we used to bribe the telephone operators right so that you know as a business we want to run the business right so i need to make a call but i am unable to make a call so though we used to find all those ways out to reach out to gather the information right so that was then okay and now suddenly you know thanks to internet now you know we can reach out to anyone across the world in no time right absolutely no time you know the the speed with which the data is coming the velocity which we call right is is mind boggling the kind of data amount of data that is generated in a fraction of a second right is is simply beyond imagination right and we all are kind of hooked to social media and generating lot of data every second right so imagine right i will pose a question here a very interesting question right just just think about it 
and we'll talk about it in tomorrow right how these people are making money right i am not paying anything to google to use gmail i am not paying anything to facebook to use facebook to use youtube i am not paying anything right and i am not paying to any any of the social media players whether it is instagram whether it is telegram right then how come they are making so much of money think about it right and we will try to you know uh, have some time for the discussion on this right these are the of course the fortune 500 companies making tons of money and all the people are behind those right and latest news right you we all know facebook bought 10% less than 10% of the stake in reliance sorry geo communication by paying 44000 crores less than 10% geo is a is a new company to the telecom why why facebook is paying so much of premium to enter into the indian market right think about it we will we'll talk about it later right so this is where the big data is come into the picture right lots of external sources it is not purely internal we are getting from mobiles and we are getting from smartphones all the social media and of course the transactional data all right which i call as you know live streaming of the data then i in there right huge volumes right looking at the terms right we used to stop at megabytes now the gigabytes and the terabytes and it is going on right exabyte and so on and so forth right i don't know where it will end up at right? variety of data right not just the transactional data but data in any form it can be in the form of an image it can be in the form of uh, the video all right text doesn't matter right i have the technology now to digest that data right and velocity of course we spoke about and the technology is available today so that is how the data analytics or business analytics is possible today otherwise it is impossible right the kind of servers that have been developed the kind of supercomputers that have been developed right the kind of technologies that are available for example hadoop is a very classic example parallel processing right and very very interesting developments are happening there so that is how you know i can analyze the big data right where it is used in business you name it and you will find the application of analytics be it finance be it human resource be it production operations supply chain management marketing sales doesn't matter right everywhere you need the analytics right so that is where we are today right and the evolution very interesting right we started with data and try to only use it for the descriptive purpose right to describe the phenomena nothing beyond what happened right that's it and then slowly we moved to diagnostic right why it happened right what happened why it happened and what will happen in the future that is predictive analytics right and then today you know we are not stopped there we said how can i correct the course of action now i that i know that things are not going fine right so i need to prescribe some solution right that is part of the prescriptive analytics like you go to direct uh, a doctor right so he diagnoses initially then he prescribes some medicine you take this course of medicines and you will be fine right but interesting developments are happening in the cognitive space right that is where you know machine learning deep learning artificial intelligence all those things are becoming norms of the day right so that is where we are heading in a big way right i would say big revolution is going to happen in this space of cognitive analytics right so that is very very you know interesting it is going to be very very interesting journey right 
because you know very recently i would like to quote this example i made a transaction of 10 lakhs right you know we are all teachers we don't deal with with those numbers but for some reason i have to transfer 10 lakhs from one of my accounts to a bank account right i just entered the transaction in less than a fraction of a second i got a call from that bank saying did you initiate this transaction think about it right how the peep guy sitting in bangalore control office of canara bank got to know that you know in a, in a fraction of a second right if it is not you then we will not allow that transaction then i said uh, madam I, i only have you know entered into that transaction so please allow it right so that is how the things are heading right artificial intelligence fraud detection online you know then i and there fraud detection crime detection all those are possible today because we are heading in that direction right so that is how the pro it is getting its prominence right and look at the how it evolved over the years right yeah sorry yeah we used to just you know stick to reports then you know we entered into the analysis space then we want to monitor it what is happening right and this is again like i said right diagnosis and you know we would like to know what is happening descriptive then predictive and prescriptive so many models automated action right and embedded reports dashboards right so you know we were at the reporting and now we are beyond analysis right cognitive space right just a second this all to get rid of this so so many you know models and tools like i said right hadoop and so many other things are now you know becoming more and more popular i <clears throat> uh for example neural networks right which kind of a trying to uh, you know what we are trying to do is we want to replicate the way human brain is functioning so that is where we are heading right that's what we call as using neural networks it's a very very complicated science in itself right so that is the evolution that is happening uh, today right? because we are interested in the business value nothing else right trends okay business analytics and data science jobs projected to reach 3 million less than 5 percentages of college students take courses in analytics that is what you know is very very interesting these are all uh, the global numbers if you ask me from the indian context i would say it is you know less than a 1 percent right huge scope huge demand is going to be there in the future for the professionals from data analytics business analytics data science right so institutes of higher education that is where you know have a, a huge opportunity there right and expand the career pathways for a diverse analytics workforce needs huge demand trust me there is no looking back especially when it comes to the field of analytics right it has just opened up right if you ask me right long way to go and it's going to be very very interesting lot of interesting new developments are on the cards right key trends in india the current you know the if you ask me in the number terms it is 2.03 billion and this was in 2017 right analytics market size and at what rate it is growing 23.8% and this is going to increase year after year right now only the bigger companies are using the analytic power now i would say msmes even the small businesses right 
a, a single entrepreneur kind of a business will also start using the analytic power because now you know thanks to the cloud computing i don't have to buy any infrastructure that is available to me and i need to pay them as and when i use it so that is where again interesting developments are happening right see look at the again uh, the streamwise finance and banking marketing and advertising e-commerce retail telecom pharma and healthcare travel and hospitality just the banking and finance right bfsi we call right banking financial services and insurance is accounting for 756 million dollars right very very you know fascinating to see all these numbers and i'm sure it is going to increase like anything in the years to come right just to sum up all right and i think uh, there is no better way of summing it up than showing this video right i would like to show a small video which will kind of clear you know what is happening right in the world outside world so just i have to stop share here all right and Just bear with me for some time. Share screen. Over here. Double click, share, and go here, share, and play. No, 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 it's just, it's just construction, yeah, that's all. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not driving. Are you okay? Yeah, you? I'm good, I'm good. Go. Oh, no, not you. Listen, I'm gonna have to call my agent. Mr. I'm gonna Burton? get right back to you. Mr. Burton, this is InsureCorp. We've received sensor data that indicates you were in an accident. Are you injured in any way? I'm not injured, no. Is anyone else injured? I don't believe so. Okay, where's my agent's number? We have pinpointed your location and we are showing your car is not drivable. So we are dispatching an Uber car to take you to your destination. That would be great. I'm pressing one. English. E-N-G-L-I- English. May we give your coordinates to our appraiser drone to perform the appraisal? Absolutely. We have received the photos, assessed the damage, authorized the repair, selected a qualified repair facility, and have dispatched a tow truck to take your vehicle to that facility. Perfect. Yes, hi, this is... Yes, I'll hold. We have looked up the other vehicle's insurance, transmitted the appropriate data to create the claim, and filed the California SR1 accident report. Can you confirm the information is correct on your phone, then hit the accept button? Uh, I'll check it right now. Okay, all done. Thank you. Your Uber car is arriving now. Ah, I see it coming. Accident, not payment, accident. Your tow truck should be there now. Don't forget to leave your keys in the vehicle. Thank you for using InsureCorp, powered by Pivotal Labs. Now I have to exit the ladder.
so So that's all from my side. I think that video illustrated, uh, you know, the power of analytics, right? Everything is going to be automated in no time. Everything is going to happen. You don't have to go anywhere to any insurance office, fill any forms. Everything is going to be taken care of, right? So that's the power of analytics, right? So I would like to end my, you know, little talk with a, again, uh, a, a German statistician, Andreas. Without data, you are just another person with an opinion. Nobody is going to you know, hear your opinion unless it is backed with the data analysis and insights, right? So that is the power of data. So thank you so much. And uh, we're the lovely audience. So look forward to hear from Ramesh Rajgopalan. Over to you, Priya. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ban for this uh, informative session and telling us about how the business analytics has been evolved. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Bria. Yes, sir. So now moving towards uh, the second session uh, for our webinar. The second session is on business analytics landscape, which is uh, being taken over by Dr. Ramesh Rajkupalan. So little intro about Dr. Ramesh. Dr. Ramesh is a seasoned leader with over 20 years of industry experience. He's a globally recognized speaker and expert in the area of business analytics. Dr. Raj Kupalan has a unique blend of academic and corporate leadership experience. He has held senior faculty positions at, at various leading universities like universities of Texas, Austin, McCombs School of Business. He has held leadership positions in academia as well as in large corporations such as Dell, Deloitte Consulting and IBM. Dr. Ramesh is driven by his passion for industry university collaboration. Throughout his career, he's privileged to work with executives from global companies striving to drive business value through analytics. He is an internationally recognized speaker and industry expert in advanced analytics, customer insights, supply chain, and digital strategy. We welcome Dr. Ramesh and thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invite. And in the, it's early morning for him and it's a great privilege for us that you have joined for the session. Over to you, Dr. Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. So I, I do need to share screen, right? So. Yes, sir. Yeah. You can do. Go ahead with that, sir. Uh, I think Doug has also joined. Uh, welcome, Doug. This is Purushottam Bang, Director of RV Institute of Management. Welcome. Good morning. Good, good evening, everyone. Yeah. Can you see the slides? Okay. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. I I um, would like to um, you know thank you, Mr. Uh, Doctor Bong. Uh, thank you, Priya. Good evening to everyone. And um, it's uh, certainly my pleasure to be with you all and, um, and, and, and certainly be amongst wonderful faculty members from, I believe, various different institutions from all across India. So my um, thank you for your time, particularly you know, during these uh, challenging times that we are going through with the global pandemic and so on, taking time from your uh, calendar I appreciate uh, your being here and listening to us. I would like to make my presentation a little shorter than what I planned. I would, you know, I don't want to hold you from listening to our main speaker today, which is Doug Gray. So let me go through my, you know, my presentation fairly quick. 
and the most of the material I'm going to be uh, going into a deeper levels of uh, coverage uh, you know, on day two, that's tomorrow. So, you know, don't worry about it. So I think most of the material that I, I may present today, I'm already planning to go in deeper levels of detail. So uh, with that, let me start. So we have, we, you know, as, as Professor Bung said, there's a significant challenge that we all face and particularly in the field of analytics. And uh, I'm going to reiterate some of the points he made with this uh, earlier slide and, and, and particularly focused on institutes of higher education and, and the challenges that we all face. We all face as academic faculty members um, in, in, um, in, in looking at the opportunity to uh, bring in analytics education into the organization. So we have the opportunity to expand the career pathways for the young um, students and, and, and kind of lead them towards, uh, uh, you know, this, this whole diverse field of analytics. I mean, as, as you saw from drone and processing data from the drone to cash register data to all kinds of data going to shut down. I can predict that before it happens. Power of data and the ability to, to do and, and provide actionable insights and, and drive those actions and deriving value to the business. I think that's the power of analytics. And we as educational institutions have a big challenge and a big opportunity to be the uh, in the forefront of that kind of a transformation in education, right? So we, we also enable the students to become literate in analytics, ability to um, analyze data and make decisions through these programs in data science and business analytics and so on. And uh, as, as this uh, statistic association study said, you know, we are about 3 million. Actually, I have some other studies that I've been access to that says in the next five years, this number will increase at least by 25% more, right? So what, that, what, what does that mean? It means there is going to be more and more and more demand for people with the knowledge of analytics. And uh, we really have to respond. We meaning the folks here, right here in this webinar, uh, in the educational institutions, we have the challenge and the opportunity to educate the students to take on these kinds of roles, right? So as Professor Bunk also said, the 5%, you know, today globally, it's about 5% even bother to take courses. And if I filter that down to maybe specific statistics-based courses, gosh, that number is even lower. I mean, they run away from these kinds of things, right? So we really got to get their interest and we really have to uh, uh, educate and, and show them that this is an exciting field. And it truly is an exciting field. So that's an opportunity, that's a challenge. And I would like to, if I could, like to speak with each one of you individually and share this and share your thoughts with me so we can find ways to make this happen, right? So. If you have to take away something from my five minutes or 10 minute presentation, I would say, let's find opportunities to talk to, uh, talk to you and find ways to institute this in your particular university or academic institution. I think that's a need, crying need, particularly in geographies like India, right? So I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to run through this again. My goal here is not to keep you away from Doug Gray, right? So he's got some very interesting ideas, thoughts, and uh, fresh from some of his exposure to Walmart's uh, uh, analytics environment. So um, I will run through these. Again, you know, please send your questions on chat. I would be happy to answer it, or we can cover some of these back in our day two, right? So. The, the key point I want to stress here is the, you know, it, it's a platform, you know, I, I want a level set, 
everyone with what really are we talking about when we say business analytics? You may hear data science, business analytics, and so on, but this is the level setting definition. All I'm saying here is it's a scientific process of transforming data into insight for making better decisions. Now, the key word I would like to point out here is the science, right? So people make decisions. People actually use data to make decisions. Uh, like in that uh, oil uh, uh, business that Professor Bung talked about, even 50 years ago, people did make decisions. But what is so different about today? Now, bringing this formal science into making decisions. Right, science, what do I mean by science? In my context, what I'm saying is bring statistics, bring mathematical models, bring optimization techniques. So when you use any one or more of these kinds of modeling approaches based on statistics, mathematical models or optimization techniques, and then use them to transform the data into insight, and the insight then is used to make decisions um, and, and uh, decisions drive actions and actions lead to realizing business value, right? So this is the definition I would keep. And I'm not, I'm not going to dive deep into this. Um, professor already talked about this. When, when they asked me to talk about landscape, I can't go without describing these or showing these at least. So one way to look at analytics is through this lens, the lens of rigor. How, how, you know, uh, how do we make use of data? In what ways we use them to make decisions and so on. So descriptive, purely looking back, that's all you need to remember. Descriptive is, is looking back at the data and putting them into charts and maybe look at trend by look, visually looking at them, and that's about it. Whereas uh, predictive, you are making use of the past data, could be past data, historical purchase kind of data, it could be uh, demographic data, you know, uh, what's your income, how many uh, uh, people at this age live in this particular zip code or pin code. Uh, Firmographic data, you know, particularly in a corporate setting, you know, uh, the, the data about companies and so on. Now I throw all these things into this mix and I apply that science, as I mentioned earlier, onto that mix of data and uh, derive some future actions. So it, I, I let the model predict a likelihood of something, likelihood of someone actually showing up as a buyer or likelihood of someone not showing up as a buyer or a non-buyer. If I can predict that, then I can make my decisions better, right? So cognitive analysis is essentially bringing uh, more thinking into this process. Perhaps one day, what we teach these kids or students, it may, it may be that it may be outdated in a sense that the students may not have to make these decisions. The model will determine it will look at the data and say, what kind of models do I need? And it'll go pick those models and particular model and run it. And then say, what, what are some of the outcomes that's coming out of this model? And it looks at all those outcomes and say, this is the best outcome. So I do all of that today. That's what we teach in the educational institution. This is a uh, hardcore um, uh, skill that we teach them. Now, maybe with cognitive, all of those things can be automated. And, uh, and, and, and what we really need then is to be able to take that output and go to uh, uh, Mr. Doug Gray and say, Mr. Doug, I ran all these, I, my model ran all this. Now I'm going to influence you to take some action, right? So that's the power of cognitive, but I think we are a little bit out, uh, you know, it, it's, it's there in pockets. Perhaps in the next five years, we might see some fully automated uh, process that uh, fully utilizes um, uh, the 
I'm going to skip this. So as you can see, I'm, I'm skipping all of these and go to this. Okay, so now that's one landscape. The other landscape is from an educational institution, what do I, how, how do I look at analytics? Then the question really, um, the, the answer to the question really lies in, what do I need to teach? How do I make my students, as we said earlier, analytics literate, at, uh, analytics literate that's going to be valued by companies like Walmart or Amazon or a Facebook or a Google or a Dell. Uh, how do I make them valuable? And uh, in order to do that, we have to understand what, what do we teach and how do we teach it? So here is a landscape that kind of lays out analytics from that perspective, right? So you, you know, in my view, there are three components to doing this foundation, Special, uh, the application and specialization. Foundation, I think most of you, I'm assuming, are from uh, business school background or statistics background. So when we do analytics, you really have to have statistics. There is no compromise there. You have to teach them the basics of statistics, probability, statistical inference, and so on. And um, uh, along with that, the uh, idea of abstracting, right? So you have to be able to model and the model, you know, statistical models, some basic level of understanding before they go on to the next steps of learning higher, you know, the advanced techniques and uh, technology. So the foundation has statistics, modeling capabilities, and uh, some amounts of technology. This technology really comes from the use of software, particularly the analytic kind of software. I think professor mentioned earlier, I think uh, your survey said 45% of you know SPSS. And that's what I mean by uh, being able to use software. But I have to admit, I have to tell you, using SPSS may be somewhat uh, a uh, decade old or maybe more. Uh, there are be better methods today, particularly in the open source, like Python, like R, with a very rich library of uh, statistical routines and so on. And, and that's what we have to teach the new generation of folks. And you know, some of us may have to kind of take what's on our shoulder, SPSS and uh, other it may still be useful, but I think we have to find ways to bring in the other newer technology. That forms a foundation. Then the application. Application is really going into the next level of modeling where I'm, I'm able to apply analytics and analytics modeling to any kind of business problem, right? Whether it's a, a retail, large retail company, or if it's an insurance company, or it's a healthcare hospital, uh, it, it doesn't matter. I should be able to understand the business problem, formulate business questions, answer them using analytics methods. And that's where the, the final, uh, the specialization is, you know, taking this into specific domain, marketing, healthcare, uh, supply chain operation, and so on. And, and, and uh, all of these together with this key aspect of business communication and quantitative storytelling. Now, anyone who's talked to me, you know, running this uh, Masters of Business Analytics uh, program um, would, would know the use of quantitative storytelling and hold on to that. I will give you a quantitative storytelling tomorrow in more details, but uh, that's, that's from the, um, landscape from the educational side and from a business domain, you got all these and, and many more. This is just a uh, summary. You know, you got analytics applied in HR. You know, what is the problem? You know, how do I, how do I predict who is going to leave my company? Or let me do a data mining to understand why 
folks are leaving or what incentivizes them so I can use those kinds of programs to keep them and motivated, right? Finance, healthcare, who's, who, you know, based on the data, what's the likelihood of some patient uh, developing diabetes in the next three years? Things like that you can answer. Sports analytics, it's, it's a you know, rich, rich area, whether it's in India, uh, analyzing cricket. I'm sure many of you watch cricket and you can see all these new kinds of uh, uh, statistics they throw as the game is going on, IPL going on. And uh, in the background, there's so much, so much is being said about a player and uh, all those kinds of things use robust analytics behind the scene, marketing and supply chain and so on. And uh, I think I'm going to stop right there because that's in all of these areas, there are industry applications. And um, who better to tell us about industry applications than Mr. Doug Gray? Uh, so I'm going to stop here and uh, leave the control back with Priya. And thank you for listening. And we will get more details into each one of these tomorrow in our um, educational framework uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramesh, for this insightful session. So moving towards our third session. J just a second. Uh, I So now we'll be moving towards uh, the third session for, uh, for the first day of this webinar. The last session is on business analytics applications in industry. And the resource person for this session is Mr. Doug Gray. Mr. Doug Gray is a director global data at Walmart USA. Mr. Doug is a renowned speaker and expert in the area of data science, corporate leadership and business analytics. He has taken leadership roles at many organizations like Walmart, Southwest Airlines, BMC Software, AMR Corporations and Sebri Technologies and many more. He's also been working as an adjunct professor of business analytics at Southern Methodist University Data Science Program and Cox School of Business. Mr. Doug is a seasoned corporate executive and proven leader. We welcome you, Mr. Doug, and thank you for all of uh, for you to taking time from your busy schedule and bridging the gap between education and industry. So, without any further ado, I'll, it's over to you, Mr. Doug. You can thank share you your very, screen, sir. Thank you very much, Priya. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Look forward to hear from you. So I'm getting a message. It says host disabled screen sharing. Yes, yeah, so now you can share the screen, sir. Ah, uh, here we go. Yes, sir. Yep. Let's put this into, can you see that? Yes, sir. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would just like to thank you, Priya, for that introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank um, Professor Bond uh, for the invitation via Ramesh Rajakapalan to speak to you today. Uh, it's my pleasure to address such an esteemed group of uh, academic professors and professionals in India. And I thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I very much appreciated both of the comments, uh, sets of comments that were made. Um, I very much uh, agree, and that resonates with me considerably. And I, I made a few notes uh, that I would like to address before I jump in to my presentation, just to address the comments um, by Dr. Boo and uh, by Dr. Rajagopalan. Okay. Uh, Mr. Doug Gray, if you don't mind, sir, can you please have a full screen view because uh, it's a it's little... Uh... Uh, problem for us. Uh, if we can have a full screen view, sir. 
You can uh, cover the entire screen. Just see, sir. Try. Mm -hmm. hold, hold on one second. Yep. Yes, sir. Sir. He's showing the next slide also. So somewhere, you know. Oh, I I see. I um. Hold, hold on one second. So try to double click on that slide. I think. Uh, yeah. Let me, uh, let me I, I, I apologize. I'm, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here. Hold on one no second. Issues, sir. No issues, sir. Is that now full screen? Ar ar earlier one is better because you are using the latest version of PowerPoint. It comes, it shows the next slide also. So I think you keep you can keep this up. This is better. So you're okay with this? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Very good. Very good. Yeah. There's always there's always at least one technical glitch in every <laughs> Uh, and I, I cannot agree off, more. So yeah, I'm working off of a little bit different configuration today. I want to see. There we go. All right. So um, I think uh, just to, first of all, I have to make a couple of quick confessions and and a little bit of humility. Um, I actually recently moved into a new house. Uh, and instead of you looking at my my empty bookshelves, I've decided to put up Half Dome from Yellowstone National Park, one of our great <laughs> national treasures in the United States. Normally, I have a bookshelf behind me full of all the books that I have read and some that I haven't to make me look smart. But I don't have that today. <laughs> so I have to admit that. The second confession is I just had shoulder surgery about, a, about 10 days ago. So I look a little casual today, and I apologize. I could not put on a sport coat if I, you know, I, it's, it's physically impossible for me to put on a coat right now. Yeah. Not to mention, since we just moved, they're all stored in storage anyway. So please forgive my casual uh, attire. But to the, to the topic at hand, I wanted to make a couple comments um, based on the comments from the two prior speakers. First of all, um, I, I like to think of myself as uh, someone who's been around for a fairly long time, about 30 years now, post-graduate uh, education, which makes me a little older than the average person probably on the call. And I, I like to say that I've, I've been into analytics and data science before it was cool. And I, I noticed the statistics uh, that were done in the survey where a relatively small number of folks have been doing data science or analytics and or, or practicing it or teaching it. And all I can tell you is that that's okay because I don't have any degrees in analytics or data science. My degrees are in operations research, mathematics, statistics. And if you add on fields from like computer science and artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning, those are really the true foundations of what we call analytics and data science today. So if you have degrees in those topics, you have many of the foundational elements that Dr. Raji Kapalan talked about that you need to do analytics practically. I'm not going to talk to you today about any of the detailed technical modeling uh, attributes of those fields, because frankly, I think those are what we would call table stakes. I'm gonna talk to you about some of the more complex and some of the more nuanced aspects that really differentiate successful data science and analytics projects from unsuccessful ones. I think that it's important to note a couple of seminal events, frankly, in the evolution of analytics. So people have been doing mathematics for hundreds of years, um, going back to Bayes' theorem in 1685. Uh, operations research has been done since World War II and it's been aggressively applied in industries that I've had the pleasure to work in like airlines, the oil industry, telecommunications, with the event and the advent of native analytics companies like LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook, 
big data, text analytics has taken off in the last five to 10 years. I think there are a couple of other seminal events that have really helped to spur on the marketing of analytics and the uptake of analytics in the real world. The movie Moneyball with Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill came out in 2009. Dr. Roger Kapala mentioned sports analytics. That movie catapulted the topic of analytics to the forefront of business minds because no one would have ever thought you could use econometrics and statistics to run a baseball team more effectively. And now every baseball team that's won a World Series in the last few years has used money ball techniques without exception. Not to mention professional football, cricket, uh, football or soccer in, in, the, in Europe and around the world. So, so money ball was really a seminal event to kind of open people's eyes to the prospect of analytics. The book Competing on Analytics written by Dr. Tom Davenport of Babson University was published originally in 2007. It's recognized as the seminal textbook for the application of analytics as a component of corporate strategy. Uh, I know Dr. Davenport, I've uh, collaborated with him. He's spoken at multiple events and I've spoken at his events as well. And I can honestly say that his book, Competing on Analytics, The New Science of Winning, is highly recommended as a seminal text. And his new version of that book in 2017 also uh, adds some new research and updated research from the original publication. And Dr. Davenport has a host of other books uh, that are also very valuable, but that, that one in particular. So we've talked about the what of analytics. What is it? It's real world problem solving using mathematics, statistics, operations, research, computer science. What about the why? Why do we do analytics? And all I can tell you is from my experience with companies like American Airlines, Southwest Airlines, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and now Walmart. And I've only been at Walmart for, for about three or four months now, so I'm relatively new to that company. All I can tell you is that the economic transformational nature of analytics is substantial. That's an understatement. American Airlines basically was able to survive and thrive in a post airline deregulation world in the 80s using techniques like revenue management, which are used now in cruise lines and all over the world, in hotels and casinos. But that one technique alone added $1 billion in incremental revenue with the same fleet, just by altering pricing and inventory control over a two-year period and won what's known as the Edelman Prize for Operations Research from the Institute for Operations Research and Management Science. $1 billion in incremental revenue, that's, that's transformational, right? Um, and I could go on with numerous examples. I've, I've published multiple papers. You can read the results. You can read on LinkedIn papers that I've written that outline the significant benefits that come from analytics. But let me just say this. IDC, International Data Corporation, did a study and they looked at thousands of business intelligence projects that just use dashboards and scorecards, et cetera. And they also looked at projects that not only did business intelligence, but also used um, analytics, advanced analytics, predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics. And what they found, and I, I apologize for that. Let me get that out of there. What IDC found was that the median ROI, the median return on investment for projects that just use business intelligence is 89%. 89% sounds like a really good return on investment. I would take that project. But when you add analytics, diagnostic, predictive, prescriptive analytics, the median ROI on your project goes up to 145%. 56 percentage points, 5,600 uh, basis points. I mean, there, therein lies the potential. And that one statistic kind of encapsulates what I call the transformational, economical transformational power of analytics. So with that said, with that background, I'd like to talk uh, you today about, um, about 
my experience, and I'm, I'm talking to you today, not necessarily as a, a Walmart uh, associate um, for two reasons. Number one, we have a quiet period going on right now. And I would love to come back in the future and talk about very, very detailed applications of analytics. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll be able to speak to some aspects, but not go into great detail. But suffice it to say, Walmart uses the full range of predictive and prescriptive analytics applied to literally petabytes of data to forecast demand, optimize inventory, route vehicles, et cetera. That, that is a given. Um, but today I'm really speaking to you in my other persona as, as an adjunct professor of business analytics and really to talk to you about lessons learned. What are the top 10 lessons I've learned that make analytics projects successful? And how do we avoid failure in data science and analytics projects? So with that, I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> okay. So first of all, uh, to any practitioner that's done real world technology and analytics, we all know that this is very, very difficult to, to do well. Uh, as difficult as the math is and as difficult as it is to build models, it's very, very challenging to implement technology. And if you were to ask yourself, you know, what is the percentage of IT projects that succeed? It turns out that that number, according to the Standish Group Chaos Report, is relatively low. If you look at projects that succeed on scope, time, budget, and quality, all four metrics, only 16% succeed. Others succeed on combinations of those, but all IT projects are challenged in one way or another. If we ask ourselves, what is the percentage of data science models that actually get deployed to production, that number is also alarmingly low, according to Deloitte Analytics and my good friend, Tom Davenport. And there's a reason for that, and I'm, I'm gonna elaborate on that today, not to dissuade you or discourage you that this is not worth doing, it's clearly worth doing, as I said in my earlier comments, but there are challenges that we have to recognize and be aware of and learn from and overcome. I'll give you a hint to the rest of the presentation. The problem is not with the math of the technology. The math of the technology is there, but there are a whole other host of softer skills that are required to make sure that our data science projects are successful. I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey, who wrote the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. His second habit is to begin with the end in mind. You want to start your endeavor and start your journey, your project, asking yourself, where do I want to end up? And in analytics and data science, it's clear that we want to end up with a model that is embedded in a production system and process. And our friend Tom Davenport summarized that concept very nicely with his quote, models make the enterprise smarter. Models embedded in production systems and business processes make the enterprise more economically efficient. That economic efficiency, greater revenue, greater profit, lower cost, greater labor utilization, greater resource utilization, those are the fundamental metrics by which we should gauge success. And that is the end to which we want to aim, to have that model in production running 24-7 and generating those business benefits. Covey's seventh habit is called sharpen the saw. Abraham Lincoln said, if I only had six hours to cut down a tree, I'd spend the first four sharpening my saw. This is all about adding skills, increasing expertise, and awareness of what to do and how to do it. And that's really why we're here today. So let's talk about the top 10 reasons that projects fail, or you could turn that around and make it a positive and say, what are the top 10 most important facets that make, it, uh, make a project successful if you choose? I think in my experience, when I see data scientists struggling, I see one of the first things that they do is they're not understanding 
the real business problem. This is a, a function of listening. It's a function of engaging with business stakeholders that intimately understand business processes. And it's about engaging the gap between business people that understand the business and data scientists that understand the techniques and the methods and the technology. We have to close that gap to gain a mutual understanding of the business problem. We have to ask ourselves, what is the desired business outcome? Are we trying to retain customers? Are we trying to increase revenue? Are we trying to decrease costs? What is the target? for improvement. So Tom Davenport, in his Delta methodology, which stands for data, enterprise view, leadership, targets, technology, analytics, and analysts, the T, the first T is targets. What is the target of my project that I'm trying to do? What is the key business question or the key performance indicator that I'm trying to address? Every data science project needs to start there. Just to reiterate what I said earlier, there was a great article in Harvard Business Review that encourages everyone in this field to use data to answer our key business questions. And there, that comment there in the red box, through 2022, only 20% of analytic models will deliver business outcomes. And again, that goes back to understanding the real business problem. And then also we're going to talk about properly applying the techniques. But that number of 20% may sound bleak, but there frankly lies the opportunity. There's so much opportunity in this space. Even after you know, my 30 year career of doing this, I still see tremendous opportunity. I think the second reason that, that a lot of data science projects struggle is with data. Before you can do analytics, you have to have data. You have to have clean, high integrity, well-organized data. Historically, that has meant either a database or a data warehouse. In today's parlance, that means a data lake where we can have both structured and unstructured data. Uh, we still use data warehouses and data lakes in uh, corporate America today, but you know, we are moving and trending towards data lake, mainly because of the scale and the efficiency and the cost effectiveness of the data lake platform to be able to create views of data for a variety of different users, whether it means to drive a dashboard or whether it means to do analytic modeling. But what I can tell you is that most companies, the large majority of companies are struggling with data from many, many, potentially hundreds or even in some cases thousands of source systems that they need to bring together in one fully integrated, high fidelity environment to do analytics. Without the data, you're gonna struggle. So we talk about, as I mentioned, data integration. We talk about data governance, data lineage. We talk about data lake design patterns. These are the fundamental building blocks to get data right. Misapplying the model. Now, as academics, when we teach our students, we teach our students about things like the central limit theorem. We teach them about distributions like Poisson or normal. We teach them experimental design. Frankly, I think that the notion of experimental design is one of the most important and oftentimes overlooked techniques because we have to design a statistically valid experiment. The classic example that's used from the 1900s of testing uh, fertilizer in farm production. If I'm testing two different kinds of fertilizer and I plant one row of crops next to the river for fertilizer A and one inland away from the river, fertilizer A is going to benefit from all the nutrients in the soil from the river. I have to turn that experiment on its side so that fertilizer A and fertilizer B run perpendicular to the river, so both have some access to river soil and others. That's a classic example of properly designing an experiment so we can block for contingent factors and we can properly control the experiment. This is, this is a very, very important concept that I, I see all the time, and I'll give you an example. 
I actually had somebody at a previous company, and I won't remember which, I won't say which one. It was a marketing manager. And they said, let's use A-B testing to predict which web page design will generate more clicks and more revenue. Well, the good news is they got it half right. We definitely use A-B testing, which is an application of Pearson's test for independence, which is implemented on Google. We test to see which page design is gonna get more clicks. That's great. But when you add on revenue, revenue is a very complex topic. How many customers are involved on the account or the purchase? How many units, at what price? When was it purchased? Is it a discount? Is it a, during a, a sale? I mean, there's so many other factors that have to be controlled for in predicting revenue. A-B testing is not sufficient. A-B testing is just checking for that ratio of successful clicks to total clicks on page design A versus B. Very simple example, but very telling that there's a, there's a significant need for proper experimental design and whatever model you're using, making sure you're picking the right model for the right problem, the right business context for the right data that you have available. So again, just to recap, making sure that we've got good experimental design, making sure that we have the correct model form. Uh, and there are lots of tools like Data Robot now, H2O.ai, Data IQ that are auto ML tools, auto machine learning that can help us pick the right model but regardless, as the data scientist, I still have to make the professional judgment. And also avoiding things like overfitting and making sure that we understand the bias and the various trade-offs. Very deep technical concepts that I'm not gonna go into today, but they're very, very valid. Number four is near and dear to my heart because it's critically important that we solve a problem that is a business priority. If we work on problems that are not business priorities, we will lose the interest of our stakeholders. We will lose the interest of the people that fund our operations as data scientists. And we have to focus all of our efforts on the very, very most important projects in the enterprise. Those which will have the most economic impact when those models that we build are embedded into production systems. There was a great uh, Harvard Business Review article recently talked about key business questions. And this grid is a very good template for figuring out which projects are most important. We have two axes here. We have an ability to activate, meaning an ability to implement, and we have potential to impact. So we wanna focus our efforts in this upper right-hand quadrant where we have a high potential for impact and a high potential to activate. This is where the opportunities for deriving most significant business value lie. So as a practitioner or as an academic teaching my students, I teach them to focus on that upper right-hand quadrant of high value key business questions. In the left-hand corner, in the lower left, we have curiosities, we have pipe dreams, and then we have, in the lower right-hand corner, incremental improvements. These other three quadrants do not interest our stakeholders in the business. They may be intellectually stimulating, they may be of academic interest, but pragmatically speaking, we always wanna look for the opportunities in, corporate, uh, in the corporate world that focus on the upper right-hand quadrant. In order for me to help prioritize opportunities, uh, I use a very simple calculation and a very simple formula. Trust me, in corporate America, in every company, you will always have far, far more opportunities and project opportunities than you have budget and resources available. That, and, and Walmart is no exception. So we have to apply some type of scoring metric to set our priorities. A very simple scoring metric is, let's estimate the business value, whether it's return on investment or cost saving opportunity, let's put a score on business value. Then we have to score the complexity. 
it may be a great business value, but the problem may be so complex, it may be intractable, or we may not have the data, or the data access and the complexity to get the data may be impossible. And then how many resources are we consuming to do this project? If we have a high business value score and a favorable complexity score and a favorable resource consumption score, and we multiply those together, and perhaps we score our projects on a scale of one to a thousand, now we have a very wide range. And we can then draw a line and say, we're only gonna take the top 30% uh, in our first year. Maybe we'll then we'll put the rest of the projects in the backlog. But I believe that you need some type of quantitative scoring mechanism to prioritize your projects. Otherwise, you just get opinions. And as we say, it's an Irish parliament. Everybody's shouting and nobody listening. We want to avoid that. We want to cut through, clarify, and crystallize what are our most important projects. And before I talk about communication, I just want to wet my whistle here a little bit. It's eight o'clock in the morning here, so I'm still working on my first cup of coffee, excuse me. Communication. I can't say enough about communicating. Uh, I think it was George Bernard Shaw that said the Americans and the English are separated by a common language. Um, everybody that speaks English, including in the, in the Indian Republic and in the United States and England, we all have our own dialects. Even in English, we have our own words that we use that are English, but they mean different things. I always called, uh, when I would go to the UK, I would say wrench, and they would say, no, it's a spanner, et, et cetera. You know, in the world of business, Every department has its own language. Even within big companies like Walmart, finance has a language, accounting has a language, merchandising, stores, supply chain, transportation, they all have their own language. In data science, we have our own language. We have the language of mathematics and the all the expressions that we use. I can't say enough about how important it is to find common ground and speak each other's language. I always tell, and I do this myself, I teach my students and my, my folks on my team, never put a complex mathematical equation in a presentation to executives. They're just gonna get on their phone and start looking at their next appointment and their, their, what they're having for lunch. I mean, they don't wanna see the normal distribution spelled out in Greek letters, they really don't. They also don't wanna see fancy terminology or jargon. One of my analysts put the word heteroscedasticity into a, into, a, into a presentation, which just means that the variance changes as the data moves to the right. You know what that means. I know what that means. Nobody else on the planet, unless they've got a degree in statistics, knows what the word heteroscedasticity means. So let's stay away from jargon. I think that you know, Stephen Covey's habit number five is first seek to understand, then be understood. I think that that's a very valuable lesson. We listen with two ears and we speak with one mouth in proportion. Um, I, I heard that, you know, Ramesh mentioned earlier about storytelling. I think it's very important to be able to yeah. tell a story. Yeah. Every great story begins with once upon a time. Well, <laughs> that's a fairy tale, but it, it bodes well in a business environment as well. Or sometimes we ask a question of the audience. What if I told you that if using analytics, I could double sales of a particular product, and then you've got everybody's attention in the room. So asking a question, beginning to tell a story, or making a bold statement. Make a bold statement like, I believe, that using data and analytics, I can reduce our fuel purchasing by $18 million this year. That's a real world project that I did at Southwest Airlines using economic order quantity models, demand forecasting. I walked into a meeting with the head of fuel supply chain and said, we've identified an opportunity to decrease our fuel spend $18 million in this year. The first question was, well, how the heck are you gonna do that? Well. Now I've, got, now I've got your attention. Now I've got 20 minutes to explain to you 
how we did that. So I think it's very important that we communicate early and often before, during, and after the project. It's critically important to communicate and act on the results because if you don't act on the results, the modeling exercise was somewhat useless. And then really addressing the, the, the classic question, what's in it for me? The, the audience members are gonna know what's in it for me, what's in it for my team, what's in it for the company, what's in it for my department. At the end of the day, all of our questions are answered by economic motivations, whether it's to reduce our own spend or improve our own budget or increase our own bonus or create career opportunities for our team. But communication is the foundation on which all of our data science projects are built. Change management is a very popular topic. Many consulting companies have entire divisions, Accenture, um, McKinsey, dedicated to change management. We all know that change is constant. We all know that it's perpetual. The world is constantly evolving. Uh, Andy Grove told us that you're not you can't stand still. You're either evolving or you're dying. You're growing or you're shrinking. And change is inevitable, but that doesn't make it any easier to deal with. Frankly, change in analytics projects is so significant because analytics is disruptive. We're talking about dramatically changing the way people make decisions, the way they solve problems. We're moving away from gut instinct and experience only. We're moving towards fact-based, data-driven decision-making. And frankly, for people that are not data scientists and they're not analytically inclined, and if they don't feel comfortable you know, with algebra two word problems, let alone calculus, let alone advanced statistics, they're not comfortable turning over decision-making responsibility to an algorithm in a computer. They're just not. And we have to bring them along step by step, deliverable by deliverable, milestone by milestone, and slowly and with great effort and care convince them that they're going to be better off with the model in the new world, in the after picture than they were in the before. There's going to be significant tangible benefit. There's going to be reduced risk. So change management is a very important factor. And whenever you embark on a major analytics initiative where you're talking about especially changing control and moving control from a completely manual process driven out of somebody's head or out of somebody's gut or their, or their Excel spreadsheet, and we're moving into what we call augmented decision-making or interactive decision-making where the model and the human are interacting to come to the best conclusion, all the way towards complete and total automation. Change management is key. And I highly recommend that you never try to make the leap from a mental or gut instinct process to a completely automated process. I highly recommend that you proceed through stages of heuristic, optimization, augmentation, and then you get to automation and bring your business stakeholders with you. It's critically important that you don't lose them along the way in that journey. So analytics is disruptive, but it's, it's disruptive in a very economically favorable way. Unfortunately, when the data speaks, inconvenient truths are revealed. Truths that not everybody wants to meet, fess up. We have long held beliefs and operating assumptions that sometimes become invalidated. So change is inevitable when we're streamlining, automating and optimizing our business processes. And rocket scientists like ourselves collectively on this call, we have to remember that human beings are involved. I think it's important not to set unrealistic expectations. I've seen data science projects go awry where we have set completely unrealistic expectations that couldn't be met. I think it's important that we balance conservatism and stretch goals. We need to be careful not to bite off too much scope. We need to time box our activities and this is why we do agile. We need to be very careful with our resources and start small. Don't start with teams of 15, 20 people. Start with a team of two people if possible. Be very parsimonious with your budget out of the gate. 
and then focus on your business value and your impact targets, your KPIs, your key performance indicators. I have a chart here that helps to show you what we call the expectation setting continuum. On the one end of the spectrum, we have sandbagging. On the other end of the spectrum, we have overcommitting. And in the middle, we have something called the target zone. Sandbagging, I don't know if that term is used in India, but that's where we basically set a very low bar. And we know everybody can get over that bar. It's very easy to do the Fosbury flop over uh, that high jump bar. On the other hand, when we overcommit is where we end up with what my 19 year old calls the epic fail. The epic fail is the complete disaster where we said we were gonna save $100 million and we saved a million. Ideally, we like to be in that target green zone, but we also like to operate in that stretch zone, what Jim Collins in Good to Great called BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. These are the goals that are the moonshots, just like uh, Elon Musk took to put Americans back into the International Space Station and then land rocket components back in the ocean on drone ships. I was old enough to see the Apollo missions and I still can't believe what I saw the other day. So that was a big, hairy, audacious goal using a tremendous amount of analytics in aerospace. I think it's important that we start on that target zone and then we move to BHAGs, but we avoid sandbagging and we avoid epic fails. It may sound really mundane to talk about project management, but as I alluded to earlier from the Standish Group Chaos Report, the reason that only 16% of all IT projects are implemented successfully with scope, time, budget, and resources is because of a failure to manage the project effectively. There was a great book that was written back in the 1970s by Dr. Fred Brooks. He's a professor of computer science at University of North Carolina. He was the lead project manager on the IBM OS 360 project. This book has been revised many, many times over. It's a classic called The Mythical Man Month and it's essays on software engineering. These same concepts apply. So if you've ever heard the, the old saw about nine women can't have a baby in one month or we have to let the omelet cook or we end up with raw eggs, these are attributable to Dr. Brooks. I highly recommend anybody that's in the process of building large scale software or even doing your models in an academic, ses ses uh, uh, in an academic setting, this book is relevant. And we have to always maintain that box, the inviolate box. We have to maintain scope, time and quality and budget and resources. All four dimensions of that box have to remain inviolate and they have to remain in sync. And the best experience to date that we have in industry is using agile software development methodology with Kanban uh, for model development, or we use Scrum for system development. And we focus on what we call minimum viable product, getting to the absolute minimal viable product as soon as we can that will deliver value. That will keep our stakeholders in, engaged and that will enable us to demonstrate value quickly. You know, I'm a, I'm a trained mathematician, statistician, operations researcher, and uh, I, I find the elegance and the beauty of mathematics compelling. Um, my wife and my kids don't understand it, but I do find beauty in pure mathematics. There's no doubt about it. But there is no place in industry or corporate business analytics to be solely focused on a model or a technique or a technology. If we find ourselves gazing at a board, a whiteboard that looks like this, we're probably steering in the, our project in the wrong direction. We're all familiar with the concept of the, of the Pareto principle, right? And we have to remember that a model is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. Remember back to our first priority, begin with the end in mind. Our goal is to get a functioning model that delivers business value into production 
as soon as possible so we can garner and capture those economic benefits. That model is a means to economic improvement in corporate America. The Pareto Principle 80-20 rule. 80% of the benefit can be gained with a 20% sophisticated model. If we think about the concept of an asymptote and that curve approaching the asymptote and that curve represents benefit capture. As we approach asymptotically 100%, we're just wasting time and resources at that point. We've got to put that model into production and move on. So in this case, perfection in a model is the enemy of done. It actually slows things down and for an incremental benefit that's not worth the effort. And that's why we focus on minimum viable product. We focus on getting to the, the, the product that is of minimal functionality, but as much benefit as possible. So I highly recommend that we, we save uh, the focus on the beauty of the mathematics and the compellingness of our models and adding one more feature, adding one more line of code, we save that for our hobby uh, time and our personal development time, but we focus our efforts in corporate America on the e economics and the economic benefits. Lastly, and I, I save this one for last because it is clearly the greatest hurdle that we have to get over to ensure a successful project and, and avoid a data science fail. And that's getting from what we call the sandbox to the production system. If I have data available and I have my tools, R, Python, Spark, Hadoop, whatever, I've got all my tools and I've got my environment and I've got my sandbox. I can build models now in a matter of hours using machine learning and auto machine learning tools like Data Robot, Data IQ, um, H2O.ai. I can literally, I can literally set these tools loose and I can um, automatically generate models. But the effort that it takes to get those models into production is sometimes an order of magnitude or two, 10x or 10 squared X, the level of effort that it takes to build just the model itself because we've got interaction with other systems. We have to do what is called DevOps, development operations. We have to automate the creation of the data, automate the generation of the model, automate the integration with other systems that will use our analytics. And we have to do, even when we're building what are called microservices using Docker containers, microservices are just mini apps. That's our model itself that's pulling in data optimizing, delivering a result. That may sound simple, but I can tell you from a lifetime of doing this, it's very, very complex. So getting from the sandbox to the production environment is 10 to 100 times more complex. Our goal is to deliver that microservice or standalone system, but it requires a partnership between data professionals, our business partners that understand the business process, our technology partners that provide cloud infrastructure, servers, databases, languages, compilers, and then ultimately it, it requires our friends and change management. So these are our top 10 reasons that data science projects fail or succeed in my experience. And I'll give you one bonus. <laughs> yeah, that's very nice. The, the bonus is empathy. Yeah. This is hard to do. As you can see, I don't have any hair left and my COVID-19 beard is gray. This has come from a lifetime of striving for excellence in business analytics and teaching others to do the same for the past six years at SMU part-time. And I, I continue the good fight at Walmart and I've got a lot of opportunity ahead of me there and for our teams and for our company to improve economic efficiency of our supply chain, our online grocery, et cetera. But I will tell you this, a little bit of empathy goes a long way. When you're working, empathize and put yourself in the other person's shoes because empathy will buy you a lot of goodwill with your business partners. It'll buy you a lot of goodwill 
with your data partners and it'll buy you a lot of goodwill with your technology and change management partners. And the more goodwill you can have in your goodwill bank account, the better off you're gonna be when things go sideways and you struggle and you trip, stagger and fall, which we all do and myself included many times over. And frankly, that's why I wanted to come here today to share with you my experience so you can benefit from that, not make a lot of the same mistakes that I've made and then share those same benefits with your students and your collaborators and your partners in industry. So with that, I say thank you, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions assuming there's time. It was great, Doug, wonderful hearing you. It's like a nice, you know, a pleasing commentary to the ears with lots of insights through your very rich and distilled experience. You know, that's very, very important. And we are lucky to hear, to be here, hearing you out, right? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, yeah, Santosh? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Doug Gray, for this uh, insightful uh, session. Uh, so now... Yeah, quickly, we can take some questions. Santosh? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. So thank you very much, Mr. Gray. I think it was a very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, based on the uh, you know, questions that we have received from our attendees, after compiling the questions, I had this question to Mr. Gray. And the question is, uh, there is so much emphasis on learning business analytical tools today. Is it important to learn business analytical tools or is it more important to learn the modeling the business problem? Well, as I, as I pointed out, um, the number one reason that data science projects fail or succeed is understanding the business problem. And every business problem has a context. And I think that it's very important to understand the domain that you're working in, whether it's finance, sales, supply chain. And I think it's very critically important to understand the business problem. Now that said, I also mentioned in my presentation how important it is to understand the models and how to apply them and make sure that we're using proper experimental design and we have the right, we have the right solution, the right model, the right data for the problem at hand. And you notice in my presentation, I didn't really talk about tools very much. And that wasn't because the tools aren't important. The tools are important but they're changing all the time. When I started out, we used to do things in SAS, SAS. Still a lot of companies use SAS, but they're being dramatically uh, charged upon by R, Python, even new tools like Jupyter and Julia. So the tools are constantly changing. Technology, I started out using Teradata. Now we use Hadoop. Now we're moving to Google uh, Cloud and BigQuery. The technology and the tools are constantly changing and yes, you have to keep up with the tools, but I would say in priority order, the top three priorities are understand the business problem, understand the modeling, and then understand the tools. Because if you get the first two wrong, the tool you use doesn't matter. It's as easy to screw up in Excel as it is in R, right? You know, <laughs> so get the, get the first two right, but then make sure you know what you're doing with the tools. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I think uh, it has answered the question of our attendee. Uh, now this question goes to Dr. Ramesh. Uh, so the question is, how to integrate business analytics in education 4.0, which is more of blended learning? This question was posed by one of our attendees, Professor Praveen Chaudhary from Vivekananda Global University, Jaipur. Okay, so I think there are a couple of questions in there. How yes. do we incorporate um, business analytics into um, education 4.0. And I think in that question, you also talked about blended delivery. Um, Bl blended learning, I, sir. Yeah. Bl blended learning. Yeah. And, and I, I, I would say first, let me, let me define my understanding of blended learning. So today we are looking at various different channels of learning, you know, learning, the traditional way of uh, standing in, in sitting in a classroom, listening to 
uh, someone who stands like, like I do and uh, goes on boring for about an hour. That's one way of learning. Um, it's not very effective, I, I must say, but it is a still largely practiced in most of the universities. Um, the sec can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the second way to learn is uh, through, um, you know, what we call e-learning channels, you know, where you can, you can uh, download modules and uh, go through and learn yourself um, and, and with some references and so on. The third way is to uh, learn maybe, you know, with the uh, distance where we are sitting right here and I'm talking to you and I can be lecturing you on a particular topic, right? So that's, that's a third, third way. And there is a fourth way, which is sort of a, um, a way that a lot of people are still trying to figure out what's the best way to do that is, in my view, and I'm sure many of the folks attending here also will agree that a lot of learning happens in, even though in one of these three ways, but I think more effective learning happens when people work collaboratively with each other, even in a... So how do I take that learning process and enable that in the challenges that we are seeing today in today's environment, uh, where we are physically separated, we don't have... Uh, uh, classroom kind of environment, but the classrooms are all in various geographies and so on. How do you, how do you enable that? You know, that's a challenge. And uh, that's, that's an ongoing, um, you know, we are, we are looking at various different ways to do that. But, uh, um, you know, I, I've used some learning management uh, kind of systems where I force some of these group kind of learning process onto that. And, um, you know, through discussions, through sharing ideas, and to share ideas, I force them to go back and think for themselves, maybe do their own research. The research could be online libraries, online uh, uh, Google resources, and so on, and come back with their, um, you know, what, what they see from the learning, what, what their viewpoints are, and then collaborate with each other and, um, and, 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 and say, answer a specific question or analyze a particular case study and so on. Now, that's, that's the sort of a blended learning process which can be implemented by anyone provided they, you know, uh, in this case, the questioner, the professor uh, from Vivekananda Institute, I, I, I think we have to spend a little bit of careful time in, in embedding this in our syllabus, embedding this in our outcome measurement, and uh, and and create ways to uh, achieve those outcomes, right? So that's that's that that's kind of what I would say. You know, what it's it's a it's a learning process, it's an evolution, and uh, but there are tools and techniques, including some of the. Um, uh, well-structured learning management systems that we can use to yes. enable these. Yeah. Can I add something here, uh, Santosh? Yes, sir. Please, uh, sir. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, these days, you know, even the Generation Z, which we call, right, they're very happy to learn, like sir was mentioning, Ramesh was mentioning, that it is evolving and new methods are coming in. They'll be more than happy to learn from the YouTube tutoring videos, right? And, and any tool, any new tool that is coming up, they are more than happy to learn through those videos than, you know, attending physical classes. Especially I'm talking about Generation Z. So it is constantly evolving and we need to, you know, go with that pace, right? Well said, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ramesh, we have one more question for you. Since you are an academician as well as a practicing manager, I think this question is more suitable for you to answer this. Uh, in fact, one of the participants, Mr. Kiran Kumar from Bangalore, has a question. So he wants to understand what is the role of industry helping faculties to develop a case study? Because we have seen that getting data sets, the real data sets from industry is very challenging. So how industry can help academicians to develop a real case which can help students understand the practical scenario? What do you I, say? I think... 
think uh, the way you describe me about academic as well as industry, um, I also would solicit the same input from Doug. Uh, he's got similar background too. Yes. Uh, but, but anyway, so how do they solicit? Well, you know, the, the, uh, the role of industry and the role of academics, um, it, it's sort of often, in my view, at least my experience, often misunderstood that it, it, it's two different silos, right? Uh, you know, we, we view academics as, and, and unfortunately, that's also based on how they operate, you know, they, how they choose to operate. Frankly, okay. in any good program, in fact, I would say a program that distinguishes itself or the university that distinguishes itself, separates itself from others, are the ones that have successfully managed to bring the industry and academic together, right? So what is the role? Well, the role for each one, each academic as well as industry is to reach out to each other and, and work in ways that they can contribute. And that contribution could come from either offering a case study, um, you know, I think if I listen carefully to Doug's presentation, he said he's, he's, he's worked in the industry for 30 years, but he's, he's got a number of publications. He's written a lot of papers, right? Now, those kind of efforts could easily turn into case studies that the academic institutions can use. And it, it is then the propensity of the professor to go reach out and incorporate that into their curriculum, into their courses, to bring in that effective uh, uh, learning process that, that gives you the glimpse of what happens in the industry, right? So, the, and, and, and the role is basically, academic have to constantly reach out to the industry, and industry folks have to find ways uh, and means and, and part, to, to establish this kind of partnerships where they can be a useful contributor. And I can give you an example of the, the uh, program that I directed. I think uh, right from the word go, when we said the program is going to be announced and um, formed, the first thing we ever did was to form a industry committee. And, and, and happy to say that uh, one of the founding industry members was from Walmart. And I've known her for quite a quite while. And, very willing contributor to the to the growth of the program, to the success of the program, and so on. Right. So it 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 works both ways. And 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 I think we have to, as academic person, if I wear the academic hat, it is my responsibility to constantly find ways to reach out to people like, um, you know, the the uh, the like-minded people in the industry. And if I wear the uh, uh, marketing analytics uh, director, senior director of marketing analytics, I would always constantly look for ways to find uh, academic folks who may be doing similar work and, and, and bring some knowledge. I, I would ask uh, Doug to add to this, if we can. Sure, so just to build on what Ramesh said, I think there are a couple of mechanisms and, and Ramesh didn't use the exact words and I'll use the word capstone project. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a term of art that's used in India. I know Ramesh is intimately familiar with capstone because he ran those programs at UT Austin, but you know, capstone projects bring together a faculty member or two and a small group of students with a small group of practitioners of the company and the company Obviously, there's some paperwork involved in getting that done, and that can be a bit of a hassle the bigger the company. But, you know, this gives students and faculty a chance to work together with industry professionals on live data and on a real-world problem, non-disclosure and non-competes and all those types of agreements. But the, the Capstone Project is a seminal opportunity to show students at the end of their degree program you know, how this really gets done in the real world, the challenges you face with getting data, with modeling, with uh, interpreting the results and then implementing the results. So when I was with Southwest Airlines, we ran multiple capstone projects with 
UT Austin's Master's in Business Analytics program. Um, I know that at SMU in the Master's in Data Science program, where my online course is featured, they also do capstone projects. In the course of the, uh, of the development of my class, Business Analytics, for Master's in Data Science students, I work with a professor, Dr. Bivin Sadler. He's my co-producer co on my class. We created multiple case studies based on real-world data, obviously changed to protect the sanctity of the client organization and the identity and the real-world data, but we used real-world data and then mocked up data sets to frame up problems that students then work on in class uh, as case studies or case analyses. So I think the capstone project, the case analysis project, and then augmented with any manner of internships or co-op type relationships, cooperative relationships. Uh, Drexel University in Philadelphia is one of the top co-op schools in the country where their students do practicum. They actually, in the course of their master's degree, they'll go out and work for three or six months with a company with supervision of a faculty member, supervision from the company, and then they do, they might even do a thesis project. So it could be internship, co-op, or thesis, or class project, or capstone project. So I, I, this, is, this is not easy to do. It requires, as Ramesh said, it requires that partnership between academia, and we literally have to reach out to work together and kind of join hands, and that's not always easily done, um, but it's worth the effort in my experience. You can get real world benefit for companies and the students. Data science and analytics is done uh, in corporate America or government or whatever domain that they plan to go work in. Yeah. Can I, right. can it's, I add, it's, can it's, I add something? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Can uh, I add me, something here with one, your permission? Yeah. yeah, let me make one final point on that, uh, Professor yes. Bung, if we can. I, th I think the key part is to have the willingness and um, reach out, Re you know, bo both, it, it's not one way street. It's a, it's a two way street and you have to be willing to work with and spend time. And this doesn't happen just like that. We have to, you know, the professor who asked a question, he could start by saying, hey, Mr. X, I first, I would like for you to come and give me a guest lecture, you know, and then build a start building a relationship and, um, and, 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 you know, start with small steps and maybe build, bring them on, on board. And you will be surprised to see that even a, a, a simple one hour guest lecture interaction may actually trigger a, a longstanding uh, partnership. You know, the, you might, the, the industry partner might say, I have a project and are you willing to bring that into your classroom or to your students and so on? And bang, you take that opportunity and keep working on it. Go ahead, Dr. I, I just wanted to add that most often the collaborations fail because, you know, they are uh, footed on kind of a win-lose or lose-win, right? If we can, you know, come out with some kind of a strategy where you know, both the industry as well as academia stand winning, right? So that is very, very important because I go back to Doug's comment when he said, you know, what's in it for me? Okay, so we need to, we need to have a deeper understanding because they are not foolish people. They are not stupid people. They are equally very, very sharp, right? So if you can, you know, communicate that value, right? There is something in it for the industry also. There is something in it very significant for the academy also. So that is when good partnerships will happen, right? I agree. So that is what I believe, right? Win-win kind of an approach. Yeah. Well said, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. So because of positive of time, I'll not be able to take uh, any more questions. Uh, sir, if, uh, Bang, sir, if I can take one more last question. Yeah, yeah. one uh, more last question and, and yeah, there we yeah. will close. Yes, I think this is a question which all three panels can definitely give your insights on. I think with the discussions what we had, I think this is a high time that we probably plan of uh, Institute of Business Analytics of India. I think this could be an answer for uh, many, many, many questions people have across all the fraternity. So what is your uh, say on this, sir? Can we have something like Institute of Business Analytics of India? I think, you know, 
if you ask me right a lot of good things are happening in the academic space of india it is not that nothing is happening yes. you know we know a very good center is there in bangalore at iim i am bangalore similarly almost iims have started their analytics verticals and similarly engineering colleges also lot of new tools you know have been uh, uh, taught there so but starting a new all together new school i think it's a very good idea and somewhere down the line when the demand picks up right then you will see that happen right yes sir usually you know if you look at indian institute of information technology triple it right that came into existence when there was a sudden boom for it professionals and every state ended up in having one indian institute of information technology otherwise we were having only iit right indian institute of technology but suddenly every state had one indian institute of information technology so i think in the days to come uh, it will happen so yes, let's not wait till then right yeah. Even, you know every institution can become an you know hub for analytics so that is where we are also striving yes. and uh, you know want to work with people like ramesh and dag so that whatever in a little capacity that we are in so we should be able to do a good job and try to you know develop the business analytics professionals Wonderful, sir. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you. Dr. Yeah, Ramesh. My, would you like to add something to it? Yeah, my take is, uh, yes, if, you know, it, it's all uh, driven by the need, right? So, if the need exists, of course. And uh, as Doug pointed out, even in um, doing something like that, you know, for establishing an institute, what is the end goal? You know, that it has to start with the end goal, and and it has to make sense to everyone. and uh, and and we don't want to be you know if, if there is a new institute you don't want it to be redundant to what's already been there so you know which means we need to go back to uh, you know doing some kind of a market analysis right so what's out there and what's the need and um, define those things clearly and uh, you know it's it's obviously this is not an yes and no answer at this point you know certainly any sort of center of excellence that spurs the interest research education and uh, brings more uh, focus into this uh, field of analytics you know it it it's it's, it's welcome but at the same time um, is it you know what is the end goal and well defined uh, um, you know objectives perhaps i think yes. lots of informal institutions in the form of what we call informal societies are already very very active in india right so okay. it's matter of just taking a shape of an institution so it okay. will happen so let's not worry too much about it so true, true yeah uh, thank you sir i think it was really very wonderful i think uh, attendees were really got the answers that they were looking for so that's it from my end so i'll hand it over to priya ma'am thank you sir thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you so much uh, santosh sir and thanks to all the panelists uh, for answering the questions of our attendees today so here we have come to end of the session for today and uh, i want to end the session with a famous quote of uh, mr albert einstein that once you stop learning you start dying so we should never stop learning so i request all the participants so stay tuned with rvim on the social media links which are being shared in the chat box to many more such learning sessions from rv institute of management so tomorrow we'll be meeting same time with at the same platform with the same link so thank you all of you good evening thank you very thank much you. Okay. thank you thank you dag thank you for sparing your valuable time and look forward for many full many more such interactions in the future thanks my, ramesh my pleasure thank you uh, yeah, thank you thank you very much i think you have been uh, a what do you call king pin in organizing this entire event so look forward for many more such events in the future and very well, very fruitful you. long term association with rvim and set connect thank you absolutely, so much absolutely absolutely thank you so much thank you so much thank you it's my thank pleasure thank you so much
thank you so much and thanks to the uh, attendees also right people from all over india and abroad have joined and look forward to interact with you tomorrow thank you so much thank you and mm -hmm. thanks priya and the co-hosts dilip santosh nagasubha reddy and of course gurudatt shanoy and who is kind of instrumental in bringing rvim in in close contact with mm -hmm. set connect and all the techn technical team of rvim and the the entire team thank you so mm -hmm. much thank you thank thanks to you sir thank you so much thank you thank you mm -hmm. you can end the meeting